So he decides to freeze up the settlements, the building of the settlements. And he decides to raise the salaries of teachers by 70%. And he goes to America and brings the money that Shamil wasn't able to, his predecessor, wasn't able to bring on because they were not able to agree on what is the vision, basically. What is the vision for Israel? Are we going to continue living in the middle of Intifada? And this is also after the first Iraq war, which also had a huge effect, Iraq, uh, a huge effect on Rabin. Understanding, realizing that the next war is not armored corps and infantry. It's long haul missile. And it brings us to today. Because today we feel in many ways that we have to continue his legacy. And his legacy is a civil one as well as a security one. It is continue the process, the peace process, towards a two-state solution and making sure that the challenging Israeli society brings about equal opportunities which sometimes it's very, very hard to detect. It's very funny to think about a state as small as Israel, which is probably the size of what state in America, probably New Jersey. New Jersey, New Jersey right? <laughs> New Jersey. So would you think that New Jersey like, has peripheries? Would you think that it's difficult to get from one point in New Jersey to the other point? Ridiculous, right? In Israel, still today, we're still tackling that issue. From my perspective, obviously, negative, Galilee. But these are all centers of Israel. But they are not yet well connected and does not yet give equal opportunities to those who live there. And that is a very, very big challenge. On the other hand, thinking about it, can you imagine a country going through the challenges that Israel is going, security-wise, social-wise, and surviving it the way that Israel has done? Becoming a startup nation while going through all of that? The, while going through all those wars? If I had stuff, my assistant come with me here today. She was born in Sderot. Sderot is a small place, small town, down south in Israel, that was rocketed since 2001. When she was there in 2001, they had three seconds to get to a shelter. Three seconds. Most of them never got there. You just had to bet on luck. Can you imagine Mexico rocketing Texas? And living under that threat for so many, many years? So whereas, you know, first of all, I have no privilege of being pessimistic. Paris, human Paris has a nice saying about that. It says, there is no difference between the way that a pessimist and an optimist die. The only difference between the two of them is how they live. <laughs> that is so true. So being an Israeli politician, I really don't have any kind of privilege to be frustrated, being upset. I have to wake up in the morning and think of what I'm doing next. Last week, for instance, I had my first law passed, which is very, very challenging being in opposition. And my first law, which I would not have bet would be the first law to pass in this kind of, a kind of atmosphere, was the children starting, the, start, starting first grade have to learn Arabic. Oh. Wow. <laughs> and that was very, very moving. We were all very moved. I won't tell you the tricks. Yeah. <laughs> because there were tricks involved. But you should know the tricks, right? To play the game. So, but, you know, I would never have bet that that would be the first law that I, that I would be passing. I had another law coming up last week that hasn't passed yet, which means, which is speaking about uh, equal opportunities for women sitting uh, in panels. I don't know if you have that problem in America. I think you have that problem on boards. In Israel, sometimes you don't see enough women on stage or you hardly see any women on stage. So that is <coughs> another law that I hope they will be passing with the help of one of the ministers we, have, we now have an equality minister, by the way, in Israel, which is very, very important. Her name is Gila Gamliel. Um, so there are things turning to our benefit.
but still the challenges are enormous, really, really enormous. I think probably, speaking about 20th anniversary of Yitzhak Rabin's assassination, no doubt the incitement that has been going on in the streets of Israel is very, very concerning. As I said before, we embraced it into our discussion, into our deliberations in Parliament and outside of Parliament, instead of really pushing it out of our lives. You know, when Rabin, when the street was inciting against Rabin, the sedition was probably really horrendous. You can see the pictures here. I can tell you one thing. Look at YouTube. It's so much worse than these pictures. It just, you know, still cannot speak. It was terrible. Really, they were flaming up the streets. He wasn't that affected by it. The only time he was really affected by it is when he thought they were hurting his wife, Leah. But, one of my strongest emotions, looking back, is the fact that nobody is standing and saying, stop this incitement, or it can kill. Probably a lot of the people just didn't think that way at that point, in spite of a lot of rabbinical incitement, you know, and rabbis sometimes have a <coughs> really huge effect on their congregations. Very, very right thing of rabbis. And I keep saying repeatedly what I see inside them against the current prime minister for whom I did not vote. He is my prime minister. He is my prime minister. I will not allow any kind of sedition to take place against him. And there is sedition against President Ruby Rivlin. And that scares me. That scares me because it seems like if you want to be heard, if you want to be a leader that is heard, you have to incite. You have to inflame. Now, we're Middle Easterns. We have temperament. We <laughs> raise this stuff, right? That's not, where, that's not where we intended to go. And sometimes I find myself, as a politician being interviewed, and all of a sudden I find myself inflamed. I stop it. I just stop it. I and it's difficult for me because I'm. My half, the other half of my family is come, come from Salonika, right? From Greece. So we're very, <laughs> very, very, very temperamental. Um, so it's not easy for me, but it, you have to control yourself. And you know, when I shout in the parliament, which is my job, basically, that's what I get paid for. Um, I also have to remind myself to kind of mellow it down. And that's challenging, but I mellow it down because I know it's for a good purpose. It's for the purpose of tolerance. It's for the purpose of practicing my giving my, myself some practice in hearing opinions that I have a very hard time listening to. I think that's being Zionist, being tolerant, is being Zionist, because Zionism was always made up of, of the veterans of the country accepting the newcomers. And when we did not take them in, then from my perspective, we're not being Zionist. Worst of all, we're not being Jewish. Worst of all, we're not being Jewish. And for me, it's very, very, very important to be Jewish, as much as it is to be a strong democracy. I will try and finish it up about spe by speaking about the Israel democracy, which I spoke quite a length about, and I want to give you the opportunity to ask me any questions that you would like. Being Jewish and democratic is challenging. I don't know why, but it's challenging. I see it's also challenging in America to be a strong democracy. Now in Israel, with the parliamentary system, when it's fragmented, and we are fragmented, we have too many fractions in Israel, it would be much more ideal. You know, when I was growing up, we had, you know, it's very, very obvious, we had the Labour Party in any kind of form or shape, and you had the right thing. It was easier. It was easier. It was, I think it, Encourage less, uh, less uh, inflammatory uh, uh, conversation. We have.
have become more inflammatory due to the fact we're fragmented because everybody's competing on attention. And that weakens our democracy. And for being assassination, obviously, we can be Israeli democracy. I think about the Rabin family, with whom I'm very, very close, and I keep saying to myself, you know, waking up in a country, loving a country, where your brother killed your father, your grandfather, your husband, it's very difficult not to give up. It's very difficult. But that's what they did. And that's what, that's the choice that we have had to make. I spoke yesterday on Mount Herzl, yesterday was November 4th. And I spoke um, with my very, very close friends, uh, 300 or 400 of them, who have, we have been walking for a long time with this hot And we really, really miss that kind of leadership. I'm trying to hope that eventually hope will prevail. Last week, I met President Clinton in Tel Aviv. And he was speaking at length about the fact that when you wake up in the morning, you have to choose, you have hope and you have fear. And you have to make sure that hope over is always stronger than fear. And I don't only love being in Israel. I really, really love being in Israel. I apologize. I love my country so much. Not that I need to apologize, but sometimes I understand why from the outside it's, it's difficult to understand. It's an amazing, amazing, amazing country. But I really, really feel that I'm part of a group that needs to make sure that it stays there, that it grows stronger, that my children and their children and their children will be able to live there. And that is a very, very difficult tool. We're 67. We need to make sure that, you know, sometimes when we look at history, some countries survived for like 100 years, like a century. We need at least a millennium, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm working on. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
I was in Knesset, I was in the parliament, and I started making sure my husband is here tonight. Um, so what we started doing is making sure that someone picks up the kids and take our eldest to the scout and take the little ones from the kindergarten, which is like two streets away from our house. Make sure that someone takes them, picks them up and takes them by the car. Takes them by the car. It's not normal. It's not normal. But this is the reality of Israel. And we always we will probably have these challenges even we, when we go back into the process. And eventually we will have to go into some kind of process. But I can tell you that during the campaign, uh, Herzog and Livni, who's very, very much experienced with the uh, negotiation with Palestinian civil um, they were speaking about quite a long term of uh, interim agreements up until, I don't know, hopefully, final settlement will be able to kick in. Um, Israel is a difficult country in the sense that, as I said, it's easier to be right wing, you know. Nobody really expects you to, to have a solution. So you either speak about autonomy or you speak about annexation, right? That would be the two choices that, okay. One of the things I said this afternoon in another place that I was speaking at, I keep thinking, you know, during um, the agreement with Egypt actually included autonomy for the Palestinians. I keep thinking to myself, what would have happened if that part would have taken place at that point? Where would we be today? As I said, I don't have a crystal ball. So it's hard to guess. But it does make us a country that feels stronger with someone who's considered to be strong physically, you know? Someone who muscles up, you know, and scares people. I was also saying today, you know, when I'm trying to, when we're speaking about the fear, we are not hurt. When we are trying to say to people, listen up, if we don't go to any kind of settlement, we become a binational country. And I don't want to be a binational country. I want to be Jewish and democratic. I'm sorry. That's what my ancestors were aiming towards, right? And they came, as I said, way, 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 way before. And when we're trying to say that, that's not okay by many on the right wing. But when they're trying to scare us, that's okay. And so funny, because <laughs> just the other week I was speaking to one of my friends, and I have a lot of friends on the right wing, people that I truly love. We always know that there is somewhere that we have to, that we have to stop talking. But I really admire a lot of them. Some of the, you know, really a lot of the MKs on the right are people that I really enjoy speaking to. Sometimes on the left I have trouble, right? <laughs> I'm very rabbinical, if I didn't emphasize that, I'm very, very centrist. So just to wrap up the question, or I would say it was a short question, long answer. <laughs> it is not easy to take back power, being on center left. It's not easy. By the way, it's a process around the world. Left is a problem, except in Greece. <laughs> Their Syriza is uh, all about um, and you were asking about, uh, do I think that we're going to have another front of it? As I said, I think you're going to beat us to it. And you're going to have a woman president here probably sooner than we're going to have a woman prime minister. I think that eventually women are going to rule the world. And hopefully it's going to be soon. But uh, you know, the longer it takes, the more work we're going to have. Sorry. You see, she muscled up. <laughs> I usually do. Um, so, yes, yes, definitely. My name is Lynn. I'm, I'm an Israeli as well, and I applaud you for being a woman in Parliament. Um, it's hard to be a woman in Israel in general, let alone in Parliament. I understand that. So, thank you very much for your work. Um, I did want to ask about one thing. Um, between right or left, I, it doesn't matter. My, my political affiliation is unfortunately not with you, but, but rather centric, and, or centrist. I'm not sure what the right word is. But I, you see, I have a problem with the, with the rhetoric on both sides, um, mainly because, and you mentioned the bill you passed about being obligated to, to learn Arabic, which I think is great. But what bothers me is,